Thank you. So, so while you're digesting your fantastic lunch, I'll try to keep you entertained with the results that we had in the working group. Very quickly, I mean, I don't need to talk long about that slide because you're all aware of the importance of data, its you know, usefulness for reproducibility, for meta-studies, and all of that. So that's, that's a given. No need to emphasize that here. Um, what we did in the, in the working group is we took a look at how things are happening now. And what people are doing basically is you do your study with your data, you put the data in a repository, add some metadata if you're really sophisticated and good at it, then you assign some persistent identifier, um, UI, ARC, URI, whatever, and then you post it somewhere, you know, paper, blog, whatever, on your homepage, and make it accessible, which is good. I mean, it's better than what we had before, but it's, I guess we all agree it's far from optimal. And it's also increasingly becoming useless slash impossible because we are facing now the way data is being used, pr produced and used, facing a number of new challenges that can't be addressed with that approach. So taking it, packaging it, putting it somewhere does not work anymore in many scientific settings. Why is that? And here's like the two problems that we set ourselves for the, for the working group. In order to cite data sets, they need to be static. We have heard this already this morning. You know, you can only cite something reasonably for others to get back to it if it's static. But research data is dynamic. In many cases, it's dynamic inherently because there is new data coming in from whatever sensor data streams. But even the most beautiful static data set that is closed experiences the odd change every now and then because you discover either an error in the data, or you do some quality improvement, you delete some values, replace them by corrected values. So this happens. And sometimes it doesn't happen, you know, clearly defined intervals, but when you discover it, when you work with the data, you discover an error, correct it, and work with the corrected data. <coughs> Still, we want to cite that data. That's what we want to enable. And the way people are doing that now is you cite the data stream, you cite, you know, I took the data from that database without any versioning at all. And that's like, like in the old days when you cited a web page and then some people added, you know, downloaded on the 5th of January. That's brilliant. If I can't go back to the 5th of January, who said we don't have a time machine? Um, it's useless. I mean, it's a nice piece of information to be added when you took a look at the data, but it doesn't help you get back to that data. Um, artificial versioning is the so far second best solution that we have, which is, you know, we freeze the data set in whatever, annual intervals, quarterly intervals, monthly intervals, and release a new batch, which kind of addresses the problem, but is not terribly satisfying because it delays the release and the use of the improved data or of the new data to those certain time intervals. I have to wait until the end of the year to use this year's data, so to speak, which in many research settings is not very satisfactory. So what we said is what we want to have is we want to be able to identify, and you will notice that I use identify as the basis for citation. We need to identify the data precisely as it existed at a specific point in time, no matter which changes occurred before or afterwards, because that's the data that I want to go back to. If I do a study, and I want to communicate to you that this was the data I was using and you want to compare your model with my model on the same data, that's exactly the data that you need to get a hold of. Not the data that as it appeared a week after with some potential changes that might impact the results. So number one, um, getting a hold or managing the dynamics in the data. The second thing is the granularity of data or subsetting of data. Databases are big. We're collecting lots of data. And what researchers frequently use is not the entire data set, but any arbitrary subset of it. So you select your, your measurement stations, you select a certain time interval, and you do your study on that subset of the entire database. How do I identify and tell you which subset I was using? I can provide a natural language description, telling you, you know, I filtered, selected those those measurement stations, removed those outliers, took the data from the 1st of January until the 25th of March. Now here's the first question, does that include the 25th of March or not? Yeah. Open or closed intervals. We are hardly ever precise enough in our natural language descriptions. 
And if you ever get such a natural language description of a subset of data from a database, you can always see it like one of those Sudoku or weekend puzzles of recreating exactly the same subset and getting the same number of tuples or records or entries from your database. Another solution that we do currently as workaround, and this is what most data centers currently do, is you select your subset and you store it as a dump of that data. And this does not scale terribly well. You know, here's my five-page report. Here's the terabyte of data that goes with it. Then you change something in your model. You publish another two-page report, and, and again, a terabyte of data. It doesn't scale very well, and you've got dozens of individual data files that need to be managed. It's not elegant. So what we want to do is we want to be able to identify precisely any subset, any arbitrary subset of dynamic or static data as it was used in a study. And doing that kind of efficiently and not by storing um, redundant dumps of subsets of the entire database. So those were the two goals. And what we want to avoid, and this is, we've seen PhD comics already today. This is another cartoon of PhD comics, how data management is happening. And although this is a cartoon, reality at least when, when I did my PhD wasn't that far off this one. I mean my file names were a bit more elegant than what the fuck arg and crap, but <laughs> the semantics was more nicely disguised but pretty much the same. And this is not viable. So managing hundreds and thousands of subsets of data files is useless. So this is what we set off in, actually we started discussing the whole ideas in 2013 but the working group was officially endorsed in March. We closed the working group, publishing the final results September 2015. And then we decided to wait with actually you know, asking for official endorsement for a year because what we wanted to have is we wanted data centers to implement the solution and give us feedback to tell us whether it's viable. The recommendations, as you will see, they sound extremely solid, robust, no rocket science, almost trivial to implement but still it's good to take a look at reality before you um, kind of take things for accepted. And so finally at the last plenary in Denver, those recommendations are now officially endorsed by, by the RDA. And what I'll do now is actually present those recommendations to you. In a nutshell, before going into the details, what do we have? We have data, and when I say data, I will use uh, relational databases, SQL style data as an example, but it applies to any kind of data. So whether it's CSV files, we have a pilot on CSV files, whether you do it on XML data, whether you do it with triple stores, whether it's a file repository that has thousands of files in it, any kind of data. And we have some means of accessing that data. So let's call that a query, whether it's a SQL query, a Sparkle query, um, list directory with certain parameters on a file system, all of those are queries that allow you to filter subsets of data. So that's what we have. If we want to solve the two problems that we have, the key thing is we need to make the data timestamp and versioned. If data changes, we need to be able to go back to an earlier version of that data. Otherwise, it's lost and we can't retrieve the same data set again. So that means if you add a new data tuple to your database or a new file to your file repository, add it and keep a timestamp of when you added it. If you correct a mistake or if you, if you want to delete the value, don't delete it but mark it as deleted with a timestamp. If you want to correct the value, don't overwrite the old value but mark the old value as deleted with a timestamp and reinsert the new value again with the same timestamp. That's standard technology. It's database versioning that has been around um, for long periods of time. Uh, it's even now for SQL, it's part of the SQL 2011 standard. It works for file-based repositories where we have versioning systems <coughs> for all kinds of data. And the other part is preparing some way of storing the queries because what we do for data identification slash citation we do not assign the PID to a dump of the file. We do not assign a PID to an individual record and then cite 10,000 records as a citation. What we do is we keep the query that you use for selecting a subset and assign the persistent identifier to that query. 
And this is transparent to the researcher, to the user. The researcher probably never sees the query. They use a workbench to you know, access the database, select their subset, and at some point they press go. Here is the subset that I want to use in my study. And then in the background, that data set is whatever, retrieved from the database, offered for download, or fed into an analysis process. But what happens in the background, the system issues technically a query. We recommend to store that query and assign a persistent identifier to that query. And that way you have a timestamped query, you have a timestamped and version database. And if you want to get back to the original data, all that you have to do, or all that the system has to do, it has to be transparent, is to re-execute the timestamped query at the t against the timestamped database. And you can always go back to exactly the same subset of data. And the only storage overhead is storing the query string, which is minimal, minimal footprint. And so this is where the, the working group for sometimes was referred to as the dynamic data citation working group. And this is because of dual dynamics. One of ones that the data is dynamic that we want to make citable. And it's also the, the way we cite it. It's a dynamic resolution. You don't point to a static data file, but you point to a static query that you then dynamically resolve to the data. So let's just give you an example of how, how this works in practice. So the researchers use whatever workbench they have, APIs, web interfaces to you know, select a time frame, select a measurement station, select certain filter parameters. At some point they press go, download, process, whatever. At that point in time, that data package becomes available, that query is executed by the system. Um, we timestamp and store the query, we assign a persistent identifier to the query, the recommendations then have a little bit of additional magic that I don't want to discuss here in detail, such as computing fixity sums, um, adding unique sortings. If I have time, I'll, I'll talk about that a bit later. But doing a bit of additional magic, and then it provides in order to encourage citation. We want to make life easy for the researchers. We recommend also to give to the researcher a citation string. So not just store somewhere a DOI, but also give them whatever, BibTeX, EndNote, um, natural language text so that you can cut and paste and put into your study report, or even dynamically link with your analysis process, the more sophisticated the research infrastructures get. And this is it. That way you can cite that data. Now the nice thing is, um, when somebody resolves that persistent identifier, you know, UI takes it to a landing page, that landing page describes the subset of data with all the metadata, and allows you to download it again. There's three nice benefits that we found out of this approach when we discussed it in more detail. The first thing is the query string provides the most precise technical metadata, provenance data, on that subset of data. So no matter what you put as natural language description in, your, in the method section of a paper, that's your interpretation of the data set that you sometimes think you selected. Here you get for free, uh, not terribly human readable, but a precise technical description of that subset of data. No need to fill out any forms, it comes automatically, which is really, really neat. The other thing is, and this is a huge advantage over storing dumps of files, you can re-execute the timestamped query against the timestamped database and get exactly the same subset of data as it was when the first study was done. You can also re-execute the same query against the current timestamp of the database. And this allows you to get exactly the same subset of data, but benefiting from all the improvements and corrections and additions that have made since. This is something you can't do with a dump of a file. You can store the dump somewhere and somebody else can download it, but any corrections that have happened since will only have happened in a live database. With this one, you can get both ends of uh, both sides of the, the world, and you can ob obviously compute the difference between what was the data when it was originally fed into the study, what does the data look like now, what is the difference between those two. We can even think of notification services, so if you improve the quality of data, if you do some recalibration or if you correct some errors, you can figure out which studies, which subsets of data were affected by these, send a notification or automatically rerun certain analysis and then raise a notification if there is whatever some statistically significant difference in the results. So we can think of this feeding into much more automated analysis processes as the infrastructures evolve. And uh, last but not least is the query store, by storing all the queries, allows data centers to trace 
which subsets of the data were used by whom and then later on by resolving the citations for which purposes and so on. So you can actually get a good basis for understanding which parts of the data have been used, arguing for investments or planning um, your, your data management infrastructure. The whole thing was published as 14 recommendations. There is a two-page flyer that summarizes that in kind of in a nutshell um, statements. And there is a somewhat more, somewhat longer report of I don't know, around 10 pages uh, published in the IEEE Technical Committee, Bulletin of the IEEE Technical Committee on Digital Libraries, both available open access from the, from the RDA webpage as well. That this, and the report describes a little bit of the rationality and the thinking processes behind and why we have phrased certain recommendations the way we did. And that's basically the, the recommendations as they stood in September 2015. Just to give you insight in a bit more detail, uh, there are three recommendations of what you need to do up front, what a data center needs to do up front, time stamping and versioning the data, which in many cases is already in place. So we, w we had one pilot where we were sitting together with the, the data owners and they said, yeah, this looks all very nice, but they were afraid that versioning and time stamping would be too expensive storage-wise, process-wise, um, because there's lots of changes and so on. And then we talked to the IT guys and they said, well, we're doing it anyway. We just didn't bother telling anybody because nobody ever asked for it. And we just did it to be on the safe side if some mistakes happen. So in many cases, databases have already this time stamping and versioning in place. In other cases, one needs to add that to the infrastructure. And setting up a query store is basically adding, simplifying a little bit a table where you store the queries and the metadata. Now, when data should be persisted, and we are not saying that every subset of data should be persisted. You know, researchers, you select different subsets and only later on you decide which ones you actually use for your study. So basically you have whatever, a shopping cart where you, or a staging area where you have your subsets. We have one pilot where they actually implemented it that way that every subset gets stored in a staging area, the queries. And then uh, up to a month later, the researcher can say, okay, this is the one that I actually used in my final report, in my final study. Then this one gets uh, persisted. There is a recommendation to check for query uniqueness, trying to figure out whether the same query has been issued before, because you don't want to assign two different DOIs or URIs, ARCs, to the same semantic subset of data. And of course, query uniqueness checks first whether the query string is identical, but the same query issued at a different point in time can lead to a different result set. Then you would assign a new PID. Um, we have a recommendation on stable sorting because in many cases databases they are usually set based so if you issue the same query twice you get the same result set back but not necessarily in the same order. In some settings the order of the data tuples is essential for the result of the process so in those cases one should think of you know, in enabling stable sorting by doing a pre-sort before applying a user-defined sort. I don't want to go into all those details here. They are described um, in, in the report. But just to show you that there, there was quite a bit of discussion on what things need to be considered in different settings. Not all data centers are the same. Not all types of data usage are the same. Sometimes those things are optional. In some cases, they are essential to fulfill the purpose of being, you know, in, in assisting reproducibility, supporting meta-studies, and so on. So we also recommend, for recommendation six, for example, compute a fixity, a hash sum, a hash key, over the entire result set, store that with the query, so then if you later on re-execute the query, you can compute it again and compare whether something went wrong. Pure sanity checks, things like that. Um, resolving a PID leads to a landing page. Nothing surprising here. That landing page should allow you to download if access is granted, depending on rights checks and so on, getting access to the original data, potentially also to the current version of the same subset, things like that. Recommendation 12 is really on machine actionability. We think those landing pages should not be just human readable, but we really want to support and move towards um, supporting automated repetition of studies, um, automated crawling of data, so this machine actionability, those fair data point um, protocols will come into play here. 
Data infrastructures never stay the same forever. At some point in time, the schema changes. You migrate your database to a completely different representation. When you do that, when you migrate the technology, the queries need to be migrated as well. And assuming that the new representation is as, at least as powerful semantically as the old one, you can also migrate the queries to result in the same subsets. Again, a bit more complex process potentially, but then data centers don't migrate the entire data infrastructure on an annual basis usually. So this is one of the major efforts to do. And recommendation 14 was basically added because people felt unhappy with having an unlucky number of recommendations. It says, if you do that migration, verify and check whether things went correctly, which should be a, a no-brainer in, in any kind of migration process, but we, we just wanted to emphasize that. I have a few slides in here that now explain those recommendations in a bit more detail. Version times and query store, the fact that this can be done. The nice thing is this works for static data, for dynamic data, no matter which size it is in some way or other. There's a bit more detail on, for you basically to, to read up rather than for me now to present. So um, these were the recommendations as we had them um, September last year. What we have done since is we have, thanks to some funding provided by both RDA Europe and RDA in the US, have a few pilots that have implemented those recommendations or are about to finalize the implementations. Many of them are, have a scheduled end date of December now, some March next year. And what I've got here is I've got a copy of the slides that were presented in the last plenary in Denver re as reported by those uh, pilots. So what you see here is that we've got different types of data, medical data, climate data, um, astronomy data, river flow data. So all kind of different settings that are reporting now how they implemented those solutions within their own infrastructure. How much time do I have? Um, Five minutes. Five minutes, because... Um, as I said, I, I don't really have time to go through all those slides, but I added, so there is a set of 150 slides roughly in that package that will be distributed afterwards. It, it's basically just for you so that you can look up some of those, you know, get contact points, contact those pilot owners directly because they know how they implemented it in their setting. Um, so the medical data is an I2B2 database for those of you who are in the medical. Uh, so check. So uh, VAMDC is a distributed database using an XML protocol to communicate with the various nodes that are actually not under strict control. So there's no central control over the distributed data centers. They're all working autonomously, so it's a loose coupling, and they have managed to implement the solutions. So for us, this was kind of a very valuable sanity check. We knew that the technology was stable, but still, you know, stable technology and actually doing it and deploying it is a bit more difficult. So we were collecting feedback from them. And as I said, the slides are, are there. I'll jump across them, which I can, if I have a, uh, here's the mouse. No, I'll just jump to, basically to, the, to the end to leave some time for questions and discussion because that's more interesting than me showing a lot of slides. But for example, one of the, the feedback that we got from um, University of Washington in St. Louis is they were doing um, a cost estimate, you know, how much does it cost to implement the solution and what is the return of investment, so to speak, when you want to reproduce studies. And um, I, I would need to look up my own or their own slides, basically. But basically, the, it, the cost was something like 30,000 US dollars for the entire process of planning the implementation, deploying it, and, and testing it. And that would equal about 15 data sets that need to be reproduced. Because if you manually try to reproduce such a study, they have estimates on how long it takes to get that data and populate that study database. So after only 15 studies, they would have kind of gained the cost of, of investment in order to implement them. We have other data centers where it was simpler to implement. Um, some of the RDA pilots got a funding of 15,000 euros, I guess, to implement it. So it's orders of magnitudes, and obviously there is more complex setting where it takes way more time to, to actually implement the solution. But just to give you an idea of, of what orders of magnitude we're talking about here. So marketing slide here, benefits. Um, it allows the retrieval of the precise subsets fully automatically 
with very low storage overhead, storing the query string plus a hash key plus a timestamp plus some metadata on the creator and so on, which is a low storage footprint. You can get back to exactly the subset as it was when the study was originally done, so when this subset was created, and you can <coughs> see the same semantic subset of data as it is now. Query store provides brilliant provenance information and that for free, no human effort involved in getting that. It allows analysis of data usage. You've got means of verifying that everything went correctly. If somebody hacks the database, manually changes the bits, whatever goes wrong, you can at least detect that the subset is not identical and does say, okay, you, know, you can't expect uh, same results in a reproducibility study. The nice thing, and this is something we're very proud of, is that those principles work for any kind of data. Whether the database is small or large, the principles will work. Whether the database is static or dynamic, if you've got static data that never changes, brilliant. No new versions, but the principle of storing the query and re-executing it work as well. And it works for basically all kind of data representations. So most of the pilots that we have are on relational databases. But we have, for example, two, pilot, uh, two reference implementations for CSV files. So that was done for this long tail of research data where researchers have comma separate value files. And we've implemented two solutions. Um, one is researchers store the CSV files on a storage server, upload them via a web interface, or in the home directory. But in the background, the versioning is done via Git. Just installing Git for the versioning of the CSV files as they come in, and then the subsetting I mean, either you download the entire CSV files and you assign a DOI to the timestamp, or you have shell scripts that basically do row cuts and column, also column cuts and row selects, or there is a, a, a Java interface that allows you to select subsets of that. Another pilot that we use this allows researcher to upload the CSV files and transparently for the researcher in the background, that data is transformed into a SQL database. For the researcher, it always stays a CSV file. In the background, it's a database. Simple infrastructure can be deployed quite easily. Um, that's a research prototype. It doesn't include security checks and, and all of those things. Don't deploy it on a terabyte of CSV files. It hasn't been tested for those scalability issues. But for most CSV files, it seems to work quite safely. Yeah, we've done quite some discussion on XML data, linked open data, and so on. What we are discussing now, what we are planning to do as an interest group is, first of all, to support further data centers in deploying that solution, adopting it, implementing it, collecting feedback, find issues where it might not work the way the recommendations are phrased and see whether we find a need to rephrase some of them, modify them, add to them, and then also start discussing some more advanced features. Currently we are recommending to use only subset select um, functionalities where you get a subset out of the data and not to include any more sophisticated pre-processing in the query because we need to ensure that those queries can be re-executed identically across different systems, across different platforms, across time. This is sometimes non-trivial. Even with some of the basic arithmetics in databases, the way means are being computed and so on, we can't guarantee that those are identical for long periods of time. Whereas algebraic operations, select and project, usually are. And that's it. So if you've got a data center, if you've got data that you would like to make, citable, identifiable in that way. Let us know, we'd, we'd like to hear from you. Um, see whether you think it might work. Hear from you if you think it does not work. And then we can discuss what the reasons for that are and how we can address that. So we had debates about a lot of issues, including a database where updates come in the microsecond interval. And you know, do you need to version all microsecond things that are never looked at? It's like a Schrodinger's cat in a sense. You know, a data set that has, a data tuple that has changed without anybody ever looking at it, did the interim value ever exist? In some cases, you want to keep a trace of those changes, in others, it does not matter. So we had some discussion about that, and I'm happy to go into those levels of detail, but they go beyond what we, is of interest to the general audience. And yeah, we'll be happy to, to support you where, wherever we, we can. Thank you very much, and if you've got any questions, let me know and I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Okay, that was very informative. So, the computer scientist in me has lots of questions, but, but let me 
ask, uh, I mean, do you, I mean, anything that you want to, no more? I could, yeah, do, do I need a mic? Yes, you do. Sure. Yeah. I, I, can, I can give a second for the audience to think about the question. I, I just wanted to come back to what I said before the lunch, because I was referring to a working group, which was uh, the Andes group, but I, I made the mistake, I was, in fact, thinking about another RDA working group, which is the publishing data workflow, which we, yeah, we, fit into, which, yeah. Uh, we discovered when I spoke with, with Andy. And these two working groups are, in a way, supporting each other, because Andy is working on the sort of a more lower level, and this uh, other data workflow is, is how you take the results and take them further on. So thanks for reminding me of it. Hey, Ella Bing, I'm from Aalto University. I am playing the devil, devil's advocate now, if you don't mind. Uh, by the system, it sounds very, uh, very fluent for the researcher to make small changes in the data and get them stored so that nothing is, is breaking. But then again, in terms of the reproducibility of, of research, shouldn't we actually not encourage the researchers to to make small small changes in their data, I know this this is a, a tricky one, but uh. um, I don't I don't think it's as tricky as it mm. might sound in the first glance because we can't change reality. So data does change. If we discover an mm. error, we won't leave that error forever and work with erroneous results forever. We want to correct it. Mm. However, what we want to be able to go back to those erroneous results if we want to compare two models. So I think we need to have both um, actions in place. And by applying versioning, which is a standard technology, we can do that. It's not like in the old days where you would need to have an entire new copy. You just do those minute okay. changes. And I think that, that allows us to address issues that we face in, in modern e-science. Right, yeah, thanks. Okay. Something else? Not for the challenge. Can, can, can I pick one of my <laughs> questions? So I, I have so many, but uh, but may, maybe I, I, I take the one about the, these landing pages. So mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned there's this kind of a future view of that this um, or this was your recommendation, tell that the landing page should be machine actionable and, and so that. Mm -hmm. So. Um, is, are there some RDA recommendations on, let's say, standards for landing pages so that we, people could then kind of harvest the data? And now if every organization sets up their own landing page, so mm -hmm. it's... So not from our working group, mm -hmm. because this is not one of the issues that we were discussing. But I know that, that within the sphere data movement, there is a few um, discussion. So there is discussion about those. And I've uh, last week heard a presentation by Eric from the Netherlands on the fair data Mm. Um, access point. They have an API which has a protocol behind it for doing content negotiation and so mm. on, on on enabling exactly that and so okay. what I learned about this last week so what we're now going to do is you know see whether we can implement that as actually as one of the reference mm. implementations mm. for it but then again I think this um, machine actionability should be ideally interoperable across all data centers but waiting for the ideal world to emerge you know the, the good what is it the good is the enemy of, uh, no, the, the optimum is the enemy of the good, something like that. So let's rather implement some machine actionable solution within certain research infrastructures that are already cooperating, where you need to cross-link and see where we go from there. The way the system has been built requires the usage of query. Mm -hmm. There is a small challenge that the, the syntaxes for PID systems are a bit out of date and none of them includes the usage of query or fragment. So how did you do this? Uh, how did you add queries to, for instance, or how you are planning to do that in handles and, and DOIs? Uh, very good question. Um, we did discuss that and decided not to do it. So the last thing we would recommend, actually, we might need some further discussion there, but I strongly discourage adding query strings to a persistent identifier. 
Um, there is one mantra that I've learned after years is there's no semantics in an identifier. Okay? Query languages will change over time. We migrate our beautiful SQL database to a quantum database, uh, whatever, <laughs> storing things in, in genomes. The query language will look different when we have to address a PCA machine to, um, to retrieve the data. So what we say is assign a standard persistent identifier to the storage position where the query string is stored. And thus you have an identifier for the subset of data. And on that landing page, in that metadata record of that query, point to the PID of the dynamic database that this query was extracted from. So think of it like when citing a paper, you cite the authors and the paper published in the proceedings or in the journal of. So here is a subset of data retrieved from the database and you have two persistent identifiers, one for the subset and one for the entire database or computing center. And that way you can accumulate credit on both, you can trace them, but the query string should not be part of the identifier because if we ever migrate the data, we also need to migrate the query language eventually from SQL to whatever quantum language we will have and many other migrations in between. So I would discourage to, to do that. So don't, I'm not really too confident with those fractional. What happens if you then do a query that stretches across two databases via portal, things like that, you know, mm. where you have two parent PIDs and then where do you add the substring to? Mm. It just leads to all kinds of complications. Keep it simple. <laughs>